sorry for the delay between videos. This is the recap video for my surgery rotation. And when I say it was a wild time, I am putting it mildly. It was nuts. And I just was in survival mode, mostly. Hospital, come home, eat, sleep, rinse repeat that was all i had time for also warning i'll be showing a few pictures that are kind of graphic so please watch responsibly if that's the kind of thing that you're sensitive about and my very best very surgeryist story <laughs> will be at the end so stick around to the end okay so just like previous videos about rotations recaps like this are to give people an idea of what a surgery rotation can look like if you're interested in surgery or you're doing your surgery rotation soon. So in this recap, there'll be like a list of things that I got to do and see, how my expectations for the content and the schedule of the rotation matched up to reality, and kind of a, you know, off the top of my head description of what people who go into this field are like and the types of personalities that you find in there. And then plus a couple of miscellaneous thoughts at the end, including how did I study for the show? All right, so let's go. As far as where I was, I was at our main teaching hospital campus here. That's a level one trauma center. The first two weeks I did my elective. We have two weeks of elective that we can sort of choose from. And I did ortho trauma because I hate myself. Then after that, I had a week of nights, a week in the surgical ICU and four weeks of general surgery. For me, it was general surgery plus like a little bit of trauma call. Other people had more trauma, less trauma, more focused on like colorectal or endocrine. As far as what I got to do, what I got to see, there's a huge, huge rate. I do not have time in one video to explain every procedure, every, you know, little thing that I did, but I'll do my best. I'll run through them kind of quickly. So saw everything from metaports for chemotherapy to like fully frostbitten, and gangrenous hands to Whipple surgeries, you know, and Whipple is like the classic, very usually long, complicated general surgery operation, usually to take out pancreatic head cancer. Also saw tons of exploratory laparotomies. Sometimes they'll be like 15 hours long. I saw amputations, fingers and above the knee, a few like incision and drainage of an abscess. I actually kind of like those because they're short and satisfying usually. On ortho trauma, I saw a lot of, you know, open reduction and internal fixation procedures, which is basically, you know, a way of fixing broken bones surgically. Uh, like a tip of the elbow, a lecranon fracture. There was like a fibula non-union. You have your tibia and your fibula in, in the lower part of your leg and it's a fibula non-union. It had broken before and it hadn't healed together properly. And so they took bone from another area and they grafted it on there to, you know, help it heal and close the app there. Lots of um, taps of different joints, meaning like you aspirate fluid from the joint and see if it's septic or if it's infected. Lots of those on ortho. Hardware exchanges, if you have like metal plates in or something and need to be adjusted or taken out or swapped out. Hip dislocations, lots of pedestrian versus car type traumas where we would have to go and evaluate, like do they need to go to surgery? Compartment syndrome, we saw like this guy fell from a ladder and he broke his humerus. It was giving Harry Potter boneless wiggly arm scene. Cast placement and removal. We saw a couple of like preemie babies. One of them had like bilious vomiting, which is concerning. Turns out it was malrotation of the intestines or twisted around in a bad way. And then all your basic general surgery stuff like laparoscopic appendectomies, lap abbeys, lap coles, cholecystectomy, colodocolithiasis, which is basically a fancy word for a stone in your common bile duct, ERCPs, which is like this way of getting up into imaging and treating, you know, if there's stones up in there in the biliary tract that need to come out, ERCP. Also in pancreatitis, necrotizing pancreatitis, yuck. Ascending cholangitis, pancreatic cancer, requiring a Whipple, like I talked about earlier. Liver cysts, sigmoid volvules, you have your sig sigmoid, sigmoid colon, and it can twist around, especially in like older people, and it can basically get, you get obstructed and it gets really big and, Bad news, and it has to be detwisted, detours. Ischemic colitis, when for any number of reasons, your colon doesn't get enough blood flow and parts of it die. Saw so dehiscence of a wound, which is basically when the surface layer don't come together correctly after surgery, like they're supposed to, and they just kind of like stay open. You have to go back and like kind of redo it. Luckily didn't see evisceration, which is where like, if you have a belly opening and the entire, like all the layers fail of closure, then your bowels like come sticking back out. You know, that's bad, bad, bad. I never saw that luckily. Waddenal cancer, Maritzi syndrome as well, where a stone, poor lady too, she was like young and it was supposed to be just like a simple cholecystectomy. And they go in there and they're like, ah, 
actually this is Maritzi because uh, what happens is a stone can wear through the gallbladder and into the common bile duct and ca can cause issues there with obstruction. Saw gluteal hydratinitis superativa, which is a very fancy way of saying that somebody's hairy butt follicles kept getting infected over and over and over to the point where they got abscess and literally had to be cut out. We're talking chunks of this guy's bum had to be cut away. You don't sew that back up. It's too big of a wound. It's like this gaping wound. So you just have to like pack it, sort of, just kind of put stuff on top, gauze, lots of layers of gauze, and then it heals over time just as is. You don't bring it together. I, I just was kind of shocked by that, but I guess that's how you have to do it if you take that much out. So that was really crazy to see. We also saw like a bunch of peritoneal carcinomatosis. It's another form of cancer that kind of gets on your abdominal wall, on the inside of your abdominal wall. So lots of hernia repairs, there were fistulas and ostomies and adhesions and strictures, just like everywhere you could possibly think of in the abdomen. A hemicolectomy where, you know, the, you know, part of your colon gets just chunk taken out. Randomly saw eosinophilic esophagitis, also kind of random, suture granuloma. Apparently sometimes sutures, the body is like, hmm, actually no. And then they'll just like make a little ball of tissue around it to kind of like close it off like a little ball and it can kind of you know maybe cause some pain sometimes it doesn't and sometimes it does and so they took one of those out not something you see every day and then from there like all the sick you stuff surgical icu stuff intubations extubations central lines people on ecmo gigantic mediastinal shifts the biggest one i've ever seen the esophagus and trachea were like over here. There's also a subarachnoid hemorrhage that had to go down to IR for treatment, so I followed that down there. I did a day over on kind of like urogyne side of like surgery, and I saw urethral sling being revised. That's for like if you have certain kinds of urinary incontinence, they can kind of, you know, get in there and help out your urethra to keep things closed when you want them closed. On another day, I went and hung out with the vascular surgeons and saw a carotid endarterectomy, possibly one of the most satisfying things I've ever seen in my life. So there's kind of like a lot of scary structures right here, right? Cause you get your carotid arteries right here. So they have to go through all these layers, slowly, 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 make sure they're not like uh, slicing up your vagus nerve or anything. But once they get in there and then they, you know, shunt the blood around the section that they're needing to cut the carotid on, shunt everything around it. So your blood's still flowing, just not through that section. And then uh, open it up and you see all the plaque in there. Me being an idiot, when they peel it out, super satisfying. I'm watching, I'm like, oh, good thing I had a mask on because I probably look like a complete moron. But they like scoop, 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 scoop. And then they just kind of like peel parts of it out. And it was so cool to watch. And I was like, wow. And then they hand it to me, this like giant piece of plaque that was just inside this guy's artery. He hands it to me to like, you know, put it into a little bin to, you know, dispose of. And I'm, <laughs> I will never live this down. It was funny, I can look back now, I was very embarrassed at the time, but I can laugh now about it. I go, can I squish this? And they said, we don't care what the <laughs> you do with this. You can squish it if you want. And then they just kept working. <laughs> and I was like, okay. So it's squishy. It wasn't even squishy. It wasn't even squishy. It's all calcified. It was not as like fun as I thought it was gonna be. I was underwhelmed with the squishiness of the plaque. Took one or you know a couple couple of squishes and I was like, all right, never mind. It wasn't even worth it. I looked like an idiot for nothing. One that I heard about but did not see myself, but it was crazy story, so I just gotta tell it. A guy came in, gunshot wound had hit femoral vessels, was bleeding a lot, okay? Unstable guy, needed to go to the OR. On the way to the OR, they're in the elevator, going to like the right floor, the guy codes, pulses are gone, the resident pops on, straddles the patient, doing compressions, they're doing resuscitation on the go, literally like as they're, th this is Grey's Anatomy 101, running, you know, pushing, pushing this bed as fast as they can go down to the OR to save this guy from gunshot wound, bleeding out, and the guy lived. He beat the odds on that one. Another crazy story that, d that I did see, but sadder ending. One of our patients suddenly decompensated and he went into right heart failure. There were signs that, you know, bowel was dying. And so one of our surgeons on my team, she goes over, like, we need to open up now. They did what's called a bedside x lab and a bedside exploratory laparotomy. They didn't have time to take him to the OR. So they opened him up right there in the SICU, took out 20 centimeters of dead bowel. He goes into cardiac arrest several times. There's an M4, a friend of mine, doing compressions on this guy and tried to get things under control. Eventually they had to call it. The guy passed 
past. That's hard for anyone. There were like 30 people in his room and like 20, 30 more people out just outside of his room. But one thing I will never forget about this, like it was a, it's a somber event. It should hit hard every time. You should never like become numb to that kind of situation or like a death of a patient that way. And one thing that really struck me, some lady came out of nowhere. She was just, looked like she was from administration or something, but she walks down the hall, doo -doo -doo, sees like these 40, 50 people in this room outside. You can see there is dead bowel in a bucket just outside of his room. Like clearly everyone is somber. This is not like a, oh, we got him back. Like, okay, okay, you know it's a different vibe and this woman walks down the hall and goes looks like i missed all the fun when i tell you that my jaw dropped but like the rage oh my god i was so angry what about the situation gave you the impression that it was okay to say something like that like read the room lady and it literally i know i wasn't the only one because i look at everyone else and they're all just like death glare at her please for the love of all that is good in the world do not try to make light of a terrible situation with a patient i don't care how uncomfortable you are the urge to crack a joke suppress it okay sit in the discomfort and just Treat the moment as it is, which is a sad event. That's that's all I have to say about that. <sighs> okay, anyway, moving on to things that I did actually do during surgery rotation. Not just saw, but did. Lots of suturing, mostly skin, one or two times fascia, but usually on small cases. I placed an NG tube, which is, you know, a, a tube that goes from, you know, put it up the nose and then it goes down the esophagus, down to the stomach to be able to decompress and drain stomach contents for any number of reasons. But in this particular person, uh, it was because they had a suspected GI bleed and they did, which was pretty apparent because when you started draining the stomach contents from this person, they came up looking like coffee grounds. And now we learn about coffee ground looking vomit when we are going through school, but I'd never seen it up to this point. And I was like, wow, that looks exactly like coffee grounds. I also placed a couple Foley's. I was able to use the Bovie a little bit, small stuff in cases, retracting, holding bowel out of the way. At one point I was holding someone's omentum like this <laughs> so that they could get the right angle on something. <laughs> a lot of staple removal on ortho. Pulled lots of wound drains, wound vacs, dressing changes. Patient uh, gets set up when we get into the OR and then take everything down and move them out of the OR and to pack you. And then I wrote lots of console notes. Some highlights though, at one point on ortho trauma, there's this person that came in with a super crushed up thumb and it had a, like slice all over, it was shredded. I got to help stitch it up and it looked really pretty afterwards. And I was like, we did a really good job. And I got to tap a knee by myself. Obviously they were walking me through it, but I got it on the first try and got fluid out and went smoothly. And that was my first time doing tapping a knee. Uh, I helped to reduce an anterior shoulder dislocation and even got to do a tiny bit of bone sawing and hammering during a uh, above the knee amputation. And a big one that was cool to see that all the residents were pumped about was this C-spine halo, which only comes around and they only do like one of them a year. Basically they have this entire setup. I'll put up a picture of rods and, and, and suspension or whatever to keep their c-spine stable so moving on to the expectations versus reality of the content of the rotation i actually i feel like i got to do more hands-on than i thought i would initially and i didn't get yelled at as much as i thought i would i only got yelled at twice the content is fairly predictable it tracks with you know what service you're on if you're on trauma expect trauma and if you're on general expect a lot of pancreas and biliary tract and liver and duodenum and intestinal stuff. If you're on endocrine, expect a lot of thyroid and parathyroid stuff. You know, I mean, it's really predictable, but it is a lot more medicine heavy than I thought. Like I wish I'd been able to kind of hop around to more different surgical teams to get exposure to more of what's out there. Cause every team is so different depending on who your attendings are, who your residents are. All the caseloads are very different. Also, it was kind of annoying when you're studying, you're studying a very idealized version of medicine. That's doesn't always translate well to real life. So what a lot of surgeons and residents are trained to do in real life is not always the answer on the test. You know what I'm saying? So it's kind of annoying to reconcile these two, you know, things that you're learning from different sources, but you know, it is what it is. Now expectations versus reality of the schedule. It was actually, I mean, slightly, I'll say slightly better than what I thought it was gonna be. Ortho trauma was, you know, 5 a.m. to 5 p.m. and I got there at like 4.45 every day, left it, you know, was home by 5.15, 5.30. I had, I had one weekend call, one night, and then my week of nights, we were 8 p.m. to 8 a.m., but no weekends, so that was nice. SICU was a little bit variable, usually about six to, you know, one, two-ish, actually, you know, by the time we were done with rounds. 
so not terrible. And then the four weeks on my core team, it was you know 5.30 to 5.30, and then two weekend days during that month. So long hours, but in between cases, you can, as a student, like we would just go to our student lounge and study, and our lounge is just one floor above the ORs. And then some days, maybe like all your attendings are on vacation, so you don't have any cases that day. Well, you're just fielding consults, maybe writing a note or two for the consult, and then you get to study most of the day. I will say I hated morning lectures from seven to eight every day, Monday through Friday. Most surgeons are really crappy lecturers. So that was very annoying. I did not like that part of the schedule. I wish they had like pre-recorded ones that we could just watch at two times speed. I feel like that would be a better use of our time personally. Now for the types of people that I noticed that were in surgery. To be totally fair, most of the people that I worked with and came across in surgery or actually for you know how overworked they are were actually mostly normal and nice and would even like acknowledge my existence maybe even learn my name or teach a little however there is absolutely a reason why surgeons have the stereotypes around their personality types that they do they're generally a tough bunch the or is their favorite place in this world usually they're usually very direct jaded and very impatient and if you show any vulnerability they will latch onto it and purposely press your buttons just because it's fun for them but if you show that you can take a hit a verbal hit that you're proactive and you're socially aware enough to know when to be quiet and stay out of the way versus ask questions and be engaged fine line but if you can find that then they'll usually leave you be and not make your life a living hell just for their own amusement so that's good also having a sarcastic and or dark sense of humor is in my experience helpful for getting on their good side make of that what you will now starting to finish up here miscellaneous thoughts not having to worry about what to wear every day was actually the most underrated most awesome thing about surgery same scrubs every day same jacket, well I have to switch off jackets because you gotta wash them, but yeah, you just kind of get into a rhythm. And I miss that now, being on internal medicine. Another miscellaneous thought about how I studied for the shelf. Pretty similar to how I've studied in the past. Zonky step two deck, the surgery tagged cards, 25 new of those cards every day. And as far as like practice questions, I went, I'll be honest, I went overboard on the question banks. I did all of Anaboss and all of U World surgery. If I could go back, like that was honestly probably too much. I should have just done U World. And then I did like three or four practice NBMEs in the days leading up to the show. If I'm struggling with a topic, I'll watch something about it on online med ed. Something that came in super clutch right at the end. I watched the Emma Holiday videos the day before my shelf. And now my best surgery story that I promised in the beginning. On my core four week team, there was a surgeon who is the epitome of like an old school surgeon dude. If you know what I'm talking about, you know what I'm talking about. And I heard that he's told students in the past, he doesn't care about teaching, he doesn't care about students, he's not going to write evaluations, so don't ask him to write one, he's not gonna write letters either, apparently. I was like, okay, I'll just steer kind of clear of this guy if I can. But, and kind of get towards the end of the month, I'm in just a little like small metaport case, very simple procedure, we do it, finish up, and I'm helping the resident close the skin. And in closing the skin, you know, in this case, I was making kind of like a deeper anchor knot and and then start, you know, you start suturing from there. Like my resident had taught, and so I'm doing the anchor knot. I didn't realize how long my tail had been left on the suture. And this longer tail had accidentally, you know, gotten caught when I was, you know, doing the instrument tie and pulling it down to be able to tighten the knot down for the anchor knot. It's easy to like pop that out, trim the tail and keep going. But right when this happens, it the loop forms because the tail got stuck. Right then the surgeon looks over and he, and he kind of does a double take and he starts walking over. And so I kind of like pause what I'm doing because it's clear like he's coming over with purpose. And he goes, did you leave that tail on? And I'm like, yeah, a little. And he goes, are you about to trim it right now? I'm like, yes. And he goes, that was supposed to be an instrument tie? Yes. He goes, if you pick up another instrument tie in my OR, I will throw you out of my OR. Instrument ties are for people who don't know how to do surgery. And I'm like, okay. And I am sweating like a pig, but I keep going and I, you know, finish. He leaves the room. The resident then afterwards, she's like, don't worry about it. I would have instrument tied it too. 
<laughs> oh my god, okay. And this is the same guy, this is the same guy, this surgeon, the same guy. Yes, like the day before we had been talking about his love of Sherlock Holmes books. Like, you know, and then all of a sudden he pulls this and like I've seen other surgeons do instrumentize. Like, what is he talking about? So random, so out of pocket. And then right afterwards, you know, we round on his patients and then we're going down to the ground floor. I'm thinking that he's pissed at me this whole time. And then at the end, after rounds, you know, I'm about to split off to go to the student lounge and they're gonna go over to the doctor's lounge for like breakfast as they as they do. And he goes, well, you don't wanna come get coffee with us? And I'm like, um, I mean, if you want me to, I can come, but, and he's like, yeah, well, don't you want coffee? And I'm like, okay. So I go with them. And then we have like a great conversation where he's like totally engaged and nice. Guys, he's the surgeoniest surgeon I have ever come across. He, like the only thing that he didn't do that wasn't old school surgeon was throw a scalpel or something. So that's the story of how I got yelled at for messing up an instrument tie and threatened to get kicked out of the OR. Then he bought me coffee afterwards. Okay, that wraps up this summary of my experience on surgery rotation. Let me know what you did and didn't like about this video so that in future videos, I can give people kind of more of what they want and less of what you don't want, okay? Okay, comment below please. And while you're over there, please like the video, share with your medically inclined family and friends. I'm in the very beginning of my internal medicine rotation. So please also comment below if you've already done this rotation and you have any pointers for me and everyone else watching who is gonna do this rotation in future. Thank you so, so, so much for watching. Love you all. Hope you have a fantastic rest of your day and catch you next time.